we will go ahead and kick off tonight's section. Uh, we are talking about storing forages. And so we have some academic speakers and some industry speakers here as well. So our first speaker this, this evening is gonna be Dr. Luis Ferretto. Dr. Ferretto is a ruminant nutrition extension specialist in the Department of Animal and Dairy Sciences at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research interests are applied dairy cow nutrition and management with emphasis on starch and fiber utilization by dairy cows, corn silage and high moisture corn quality and digestibility, and the use of alternative byproducts as feed ingredients. So welcome, Dr. Ferretto, and we'll go ahead and let you take it away. Thank you, Gail, for the invitation uh, to be here today, as well as the introduction. Um, you know, uh, all the time we have the opportunity to discuss a little bit more about silage is something that makes me very happy. So, you know, when I think about silage, I think that are a lot of small things that at the end of the day will be very big things, but uh, a lot of small things that we have to consider in order to make sure our final material is great, right? And that starts planning a year before when you start organizing the hybrids and the land that you're going to use and, you know, and ends with the day that you open the silo, but it does not end until you actually truly feed that silage. So basically what I'll go through today are a couple things that I think are key to make sure we can have silage fermentation go very well in order to make sure two different things. First, all the material you put in is very close to the material that you will actually be feeding, right? And second, that everything that you are feeding is in very good quality or in very good condition. So when I think about the silage or the ensiling process, the first thing that comes to mind is losses, right? Sometimes we refer to those as dry matter losses, sometimes as nutrient losses. At the end of the day, regardless if you are losing uh, dry matter or nutrients, you know, uh, this is probably a reduction in your overall feed efficiency, right? If you consider silage production in terms of feed efficiency, at the end of the day, each unit of silage that you produce but do not feed it means that you are less efficient, right? It's less feed that you are actually feeding to the dairy cow. So from my perspective, it is a loss of feed efficiency. However, if we go back through literature, uh, Dr. Bolson uh, put together these um, numbers for us many years ago. And if you think about that, there are some losses that we just cannot avoid. Right, And part of that is because there are some field losses while we are harvesting and carrying some of those forages back to the ensiling area. But after we move those back to the ensiling area, there is some respiration of the plants that will be going on. Right, There's no way we can uh, avoid that 100% but we can minimize a little bit of that. Right, Basically respiration is some of the oxygen that's still there will be used up by some of those uh, plant tissues together with substrates. I think that's what's key here. And then it will reduce the material that will first reach fermentation, but later that will reach the dairy cow. And after that, there is some losses related to fermentation, right? I think the nice thing about silage fermentation is that we are able to, or not we, but bacteria is able to use some of the substrate or some of the sugars that are available in silage and transform that into acids that will drop the pH and make sure we can preserve silage for a long period. Right. However, there are also losses that they are extremely avoidable. And these are the losses that I think we should work on making sure is very close to zero, right? This would be secondary fermentation. For example, if you don't have a very good fermentation uh, early on and you leave an environment where pH is high and some of the buffering capacity of the silo is also high, then there is some bacteria that will be fermenting into undesired products. For example, butyric acid, right? But then after that, there are two other losses that we have to be very careful with. One is aerobic deterioration during storage. So any air that stays in trapping that silage 
But more important, any air that enters after you close the silage, any hole in the, uh, in the bag, any hole in the plastic that you cover your silo, anything like that. And then after that, the aerobic deterioration after storage. Sometimes that goes very fast. Sometimes uh, we have some window to manage the silo well and don't lose a lot of that, right? But at the end of the day, losses may be from five, maybe to 40% of the dry matter of the silage. And let's be honest, if you lose 40% of your silage dry matter, there is no way you can be efficient, right? So here is just a small set of guidelines and I promise I'm not gonna talk about all of them, okay? Cause we don't have time for that. But some of the guidelines that I highly suggest you to consider and think about because all those different things affect silage fermentation and the overall loss uh, during silage preservation. The first one is make sure you harvest, regardless of the crop that you are harvesting at a stage of maturity that optimize quality and quantity. There is no correct number here, right? We often try to put a target, but every dairy has a different requirement, right? So you have to think, what is the sweet spot for you? So where do I reach the maximum productivity while keeping the maximum quality of that forage? And the only person that can answer that is you together with your team, right? In order to make sure you reach that point. Right? Make sure together with the proper stage of maturity that you are accounting for dry matter content. But Luis, those are connected, right? Yes, these are connected. But when we talk about corn silage, for example, you have to consider dry matter content and kernel milk line, right? But at the end of the day, we need to make sure we pay close attention to dry matter because the drier the material, harder it is to ferment. And I'm gonna show you a quick data set about that next. Also make sure you shop the forage into small particles, right? Into small particles, I'm not telling you to, to shop that extremely fine in a way that the cows cannot use that properly and will not buffer the rumen in terms of effective fiber. But I'm telling you here is keep good track of that because if you have issues with settings uh, of your shopper or if by any chance you are harvesting a material that is too dry, sometimes the material will be much coarser than expected. And coarser particles will entrap more oxygen, which will make those losses that we just discussed higher, okay? Make sure you avoid silage contamination with dirt. All the time we talk about silage contamination with dirt, we think about mud, right? But it's not just that, right? If you brought a couple of tractors from the field, even if they are not covering mud, it's just a little bit of uh, uh, dust, a little bit of dirt, you are bringing things to the silo that perhaps shouldn't be there. You very likely are bringing a lot of yeasts to the silo. And I'm gonna show you in a minute that yeasts are the problem when you have oxygen coming back to the silo when you open it. Make sure you fill your silo rapidly with one condition by making sure that's properly packed, right? Don't fill everything in close because that's not gonna work, but you cannot take too long to fill the silo. The more you take to fill the silo, more that respiration phase I mentioned earlier will remain and you'll be losing some oxygen, right? Pack the silo the best you can to expel as much oxygen as possible. Obviously, there is no way you can remove 100% of the oxygen, right? But you can remove a lot of it. And the least oxygen that's there faster we reach the anaerobic fermentation stage, which is when bacteria can produce those acids, reduce pH and preserve silage. Then I went too quickly here, but uh, use if possible inoculants or chemical additives, depending on your needs, right? And the crops that you are utilizing. And when you open the silo, make sure you remove enough material a day. So there is not entrance of a lot of oxygen that will deteriorate that too fast. So here is just to exemplify to you the issues related to the dry matter content. Okay, this was a review. Uh, and this particular case here, we are talking about whole plant corn silage. So what you can see here, if we use the blue line as an example, is silage pH. And you can see that as you start progressing from the 30, 35 percentage of dry matter range to 35, 40 and beyond, you start seeing an increase in pH, right? And I think that's very important because there are a lot of factors associated with that, right? Uh, first, you may have coarser particles, as I mentioned, right? Which takes longer to start fermentation. 
bacteria also struggles more when there is not enough water in the silage. And yeah, there is still enough water at 40%, but there is less than at 35, right? And you can see that uh, the green line, the total acids line reduces as the maturity progresses or the dry matter content of the forage increases. So basically what's happening here is if you in silo forage is too dry, fermentation is not going to be as good as if they were harvested at the perfect, if there is a perfect uh, maturity stage. Um, so with that, I will slightly transition to the importance of avoiding yeasts and molds, right? And here is the reason why, okay? This is a slide by Dr. Lim Ming Kong. And basically uh, what we can see with this slide is, let's use the storage or feed out section here on the right. As soon as you open the silo, there is oxygen exposure, okay? As soon as that happens, you're gonna have a chain reaction. First, oxygen is there. So yeasts that are dormant, they will start acting and they will start using substrates that are available. Substrates could be sugars that are still there. Usually there are not a lot of sugars if you had good fermentation, but depending on the crop you may, right? But they can also use lactic acid. Lactic acid is actually what we want the most in silage, but as soon as it's open, yeast will consume those and starts creating problems. Then pH starts to go up, molds start also consuming different substrates, and that's when you have issues with aerobic deterioration, okay? That's a very simplified version of that, but that's usually how, how it occurs, including heating and a couple other issues associated with that. So what's the goal here? The goal is to minimize the issue when you allow air to go back to the silage, right? So, and the reason why I'm saying that is, uh, this is a slide shared by uh, John Gazer from Rock River Labs, and basically, uh, in this slide here, what you can see is there is a lot of variation in yeast concentration in silage harvest in the United States, right? The problem is it's very hard to know where you are at, right? There are years that you may be perfect and below this red line here that we set as a threshold, right? But there are years that the weather or any other issues may cause you to be on the upper end here, which would be an issue. Right, so we need to make sure we control for that, right? One of the ways that you can use to control for that, okay, I'm not saying it's the only way, everything matters in terms of silage fermentation, but one of the possibilities is using microbial inoculants that contain uh, heterofermentative bacteria. Heterofermentative bacteria is a bacteria that produces acetic acid, okay? In this case, I'm using the example of Lactobacillus buckneri, which is the most utilized uh, not only in the United States, but worldwide. But why do we suggest the use of this type of inoculant in conditions where you want to avoid aerobic deterioration at the opening? The reason we suggest that is this specific type of bacteria at a certain point during fermentation it starts producing acetic acid. Usually we will use some of the lactic acid, we'll produce acetic acid and one, two proponotile, and acetic acid actually inhibits yeast growth and proliferation at feed out, right? So here, if I show you the effects of Lactobacillus buckneri, this is a review of literature. Uh, basically, the way we are demonstrating that is control with silage that did not use any inoculant, okay? Most of those studies are laboratory silos, keep that in mind. And difference is basically uh, the silage containing Lactobacillus buckneri inoculated minus the control, okay? So basically, for pH, when you use Lactobacillus buckneri, pH is a little bit higher. And part of that is because they will be using some of those lactic acid, okay? And you can see the lactate is reduced because of that. But you can see that acetic acid also increase, one, two proponodiol also increase, as I just mentioned how they produce that, but yeast and mold counts are reduced. Right, and more important than that, aerobic stability increases. Aerobic stability is what we use in research to estimate silage shelf life. Basically, the way we do that in the lab is we collect the silage sample, put in a bucket, then we put temperature sensors, and we see how long does it take for the silage to have a temperature five degree Fahrenheit greater than the initial fermentation, sorry, then the initial silage at opening or then the environment temperature, depending on how you measure that. Either way, it's fine, 
right? So basically what this number here is telling me is that silage that's inoculated with this type of bug can last at least 80 more hours. Luis, is this true on farm, right? It's very hard to calculate that on farm. There are many metrics that affect that. For example, feed out rate, right? But I'll tell you that usually if you have a good fermentation with this type of inoculant that really leads to both lactic and acetic acid, usually it protects well and you see less feed warming up in the feed bunk, especially during the summer. Okay, it's something to consider. Obviously, there are prices that have to be considered. Uh, there are multiple products from different companies. I suggest you to consider products that are actually research proven, okay, because there are a lot of products in the market. And with that, I hope I didn't take too much at the time. No, that was perfect. Thank you. Lots of points for discussion later. Uh, we are going to go ahead and move into our next speakers. Uh, uh, Connie, I, I guess you guys are probably going to tag team this a little bit. Yes. Um, and so next we have Ron and Connie Cooper uh, from Counter AgriScience. I will let them introduce themselves because it looks like in the slideshow that they have uh, some introductory slides in there as well. So is everybody seeing my screen okay? Yes. All right, uh, Connie, I'll let you guys take it away. Okay, so I'm Connie Cooper and um, I grew up a little girl in Lake Elmo, Lake City, Minnesota on a small uh, registered Holstein dairy farm and uh, went to the school at uh, at, at the University of Minnesota, got a degree in ag journalism and moved to California after graduation to work for Worldwide Sires. And so I have um, spent my life in promotion and advertising and marketing. And um, after being at Worldwide for about seven years, um, I we Ron and I had been married by that time and we uh, had a little girl named Catherine and I decided to stay home with her. Uh, and it took all of about two weeks for me to figure out that I needed to do something else too. And so I started freelance writing uh, for several different dairy, uh, dairy publications and ending up with writing for Dairy Today on a regular basis with Jim Dickroll. Um, but uh, there I am milking our cow, uh, Saposka Cleo, um, one of my brother's favorite cows. She was a, a great, excellent cow. And then um, uh, Ron will tell you too that after, uh, uh, it's been about 25 years that Ron and I went into business together um, with Connor Marketing at the time. Now we call it Connor AgriScience to better reflect our company. And, um, and that's Ron, our daughter, Madeline, who works with us as well, doing all of our financial um, uh, business, and myself. And we have focused on silage for the last um, 15 years, especially when we introduced oxygen barrier to the Western states. Um, and uh, about uh, seven years ago, we had a, um, a difference of opinion with our supplier and, um, and in order to better serve our customers, we went and found our own um, manufacturing. And so that's how SealPro was developed. SealPro is our own uh, Connor AgriScience brand. So um, we're really happy to be here today. We're, we believe that we're an educational company um, we don't just sell stuff. We try to teach people how to make and manage better feed for their, for their cattle and hopefully save them some money and save some lives through safety. So, and, uh, oh, can you back up, just back up real quick here? Uh, yeah, yeah Dr. Ferretto, I wanted to, well, thank you for, uh, you know, bringing slides up and mentioning the names of, uh, two of the PhDs who I learned an awful lot from, uh, uh, visiting with in person and over the phone, and, can, and that was Dr. Uh, Lehman Kung and uh, Dr. Keith Bolson, who's pictured with me uh, in a lift in the in the lower right hand corner. And I don't know, as tall as he was, he was uh, deathly afraid of heights. Um, and for him to get into that lift so he could get a bird's eye view of a drive over pile being made in California that we've been working with this one operation to get him to change their practices for about five years. And we finally got him to commit to put a couple extra pack tractors onto the, uh, onto the pile. And so I gave him the opportunity to see it from a bird's eye view. And uh, one of the things I always appreciate, Dr. appreciated about Dr. Bolson was he always started off his talks um, with referring to some of his sur silage experience. Well, in the lower left-hand corner, you can see an old, uh, uh, you, you think that that might be in the Midwest somewhere, but that's actually in San Luis Obispo County, 
uh, California, over by the old beef unit at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Uh, that still exists today, but in 1974, I had a uh, uh, an, oat, uh, an oatledge uh, uh, project, uh, enterprise project that I was part of, and that was the first silage that I had made. Uh, and of course, it had to be a drought year, so it was. It was. There were a lot of uh, challenges and, and learning experiences in that situation. So, okay. Next slide, please. Uh, what we want to focus on today is uh, uh, storage structures and how they impact uh, your opportunity for dry matter recovery. And um, on, the, on the far, on the left, uh, you know, you see a typical uh, Midwestern, uh, you know, type of structure. I mean, there's, there's a, they can be made from a number of different varieties uh, uh, on, on, on from uh, concrete up to um, uh, glass lined uh, material that were designed to be oxygen limiting. Uh, there, there were you know properly used and maintained. Uh, they were very effective at uh, providing uh, dry matter recovery, uh, but uh, the, the limitations to them uh, very expensive to maintain. Uh, and the plus, there's a limitation to how much forage you can you can put into those and grow without having to add a whole um, uh, stack of these you know, side by side by side. Uh, in the middle. Um, the uh, uh, bunker, a walled bunker silo. Uh, and on the far right hand side, uh, we have a, a, just an illustration of a drive, a three to one drive over pile. Uh, now, one of the things, last one of last week's speakers, uh, Dr. Bill Mahano. Oh, next slide. Oh, yeah, next please. slide. There we go. Uh, okay. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, Dr. Mahano last week had mentioned. Uh, was about if that you're going to put a driver pile that using an oxygen barrier film um, is an absolute must. And he, he mentioned that, but he didn't explain why. Uh, and, I, and I won't assume that everyone knows why, but if you look at, uh, if you take in the, the uh, top three feet of a bunker silo, for example, um, the percentage of the total feed that's in that upper three feet, outer three feet, versus in a drive over pile uh, is significant. So having a seal, um, like Dr. Ferretto had talked about, when you finish up the silage pile is all the more critical to make sure you've got a, an effective seal with an appropriate barrier so you can't get oxygen coming through the plastic. And, uh, and on the far right, um, we, you know, we, we, we're, we're, in, we're in California, we, uh, uh, but we see you know, there's still a, a lot of these piles, uh, uh, push-up piles uh, that really are not, they're not packed, they're not, uh, uh, they're not truly a drive over pile, and we strongly discourage uh, this type of a structure for uh, storing your forage. But to be fair, California producers have really kind of moved on. Oh, and yeah. There's a ton of people who make nice drive over piles. Okay, next. Yep. Okay, so we talk about planning a bunker, and we won't go through all these different points. Um, you know, we need to figure out um, where we're going to put a pile, how big of a pile we're going to need for the number of, of tons that we're going to be harvesting. Um, one thing important for silage uh, safety is to measure the height of how high is your unloader, how high can they reach, so that you're not going to be doing things like uh, scooping in and caving off that kind of thing for for safety. Another important thing is the foundation that you're going to put it on. Are you going to put it on dirt? Are you going to put it on concrete? And then the ultimate um, we feel is asphalt topped concrete. So that's all things to think about. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Uh, yeah, again, part of, you know, we, uh, you can see what uh, the, uh, the, the, the silo in the background looked from the previous year. Uh, this was uh, the following year uh, from, you know, being able to map out an area for an appropriate storage area. Um, and they almost got this a little bit too, uh, too shallow slope. It was almost more to a, closer to a five, five to one than a four to one slope. But they did a, a just an absolute bang of job in getting the uh, uh, proper uh, weight in relation to the flow of material to the to the to the uh, silo. Uh, they had a long, uh, shallow uh, slope, uh, so they were able to uh, get this packed uh, very very well. 
Um, and so the whole point is to and make your plan and then make adjustments as you uh, as you go along. Great. Next slide, please. And here we mentioned about the density. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the 800 pound rule, and and that is to to uh, make a calculation. You know, not based on how fast can our choppers fill up trucks, but okay, how many tractors? What's the weight? The total weight of the tractors that we have available to be committed to the packing process. And so, you know, you uh, for every 800 pounds of packing weight, that's the the minimum amount you need per ton per uh, for every ton per hour being brought out from the field. So if you're you know if you're looking at um, you know bringing in 100 tons uh, an hour, uh, then you've got to have uh, two forty thousand pound tractors uh, committed to being on that pile uh, during the uh, harvest process. Yeah, Dr. Mahan mentioned that last week too that he was suggesting a lot of weight on that pile. Yeah. And uh, um, six inch layers, um, pushing that fit up on six in six inch layers and a long, shallow ramp. Okay, next. Uh, you know, one of the things I've tried to demonstrate to uh, dairy producers that we work with is to uh, take, just take a walk on the silage pile after they're, they think that they're done, you know, after they think they've done, done a good job um, and just see how, how, how far our boots sink into the top of the silage. Now it's not an indication of the whole pile, but you know it's just it's just something. I mean, I seriously have had you know my boots disappear before when I've when I oh I'm, we've been up to our <laughs> knees before. <laughs> we've demonstrated this, and uh, but the uh, but the whole point is if if a plan is made out and you're committed to having the amount the the proper weight, you're putting th six inch layers, packing each layer at a time, uh, and fo following through on that uh, plan. Um, not driving diagonally up the side, um, especially if you've got something that's anything sh sh uh, more steep than a three to one uh, side uh, uh, slope, um, that's going to be just providing a lot of wheel slip on there and that disturbs what you've got underneath, not packing what you're putting on top. Right, it just, we had a situation one time where, um, a very good longtime customer called. He was really upset because um, he had so much spoilage on on his um, on his pile. And every we took all of our people up there to take a look at this, and it turned out that he had changed uh, choppers, and um, the pack tractor driver was doing that kind of a herringbone up the side of that silage pile rather than going perpendicular over it. And so we were lucky that they were. Um, making winter forage that day and we were able to show him how that silage was being fluffed out along the edges and that's exactly where he had seen the problem before so drive perpendicular and forward reverse repeat and uh, no circling on the pile stay on the pile next okay economics of ceiling go ahead you're the math guy <laughs> Yeah, these were some numbers that uh, uh, there were some some of the work that Dr. Bolson done at K-State um, and uh, the um, uh, in, in reference to a, uh, a no cover uh, is, you know, having about a 50% loss of dry matter. And in this um, uh, in this illustration here, uh, looking at the bunker silo on the left, uh, 75 feet wide, 14 feet high. Uh, the top three feet density of about 40 pounds as fed, below about 50, uh, 6,000 tons of silage at uh, 7,000 tons. Oh, 7, tons at $630,000 worth of product, uh, worth of uh, uh, corn silage. Um, the uh, top three feet, uh, there's about 1,250 uh, tons. And uh, the losses are indicated there with no cover. You're looking at a 50% loss. With if you just put a black and white uh, five, four or five or six mil cover on there, your you still your loss is about thirty three thousand uh, dollars. Using a true oxygen barrier, uh, you're still going to have a loss, but it's going to be about half of what it would be uh, with the uh, just a black and white cover. So compared to no cover, uh, that combination of uh, 
uh, a, an effective uh, oxygen, a true oxygen barrier, and, and then effective black white protective cover um, is going to save about 95,000. And then on the right, the illustration of, uh, and again, this, this, this makes the point of you know, what Dr. Mahan was saying last week as to why it's really critical, especially critical to use oxygen barrier on a drive over pile is because you've got so much more uh, that you know, you're up to 2,150 tons, an extra 900, you know, almost double the amount of tonnage in the top three feet. And of course, you know, so then but as you go through the uh, calculations, you're, you're looking at saving about $154,000 in feed value uh, in the differential between a no cover loss and a um, oxygen barrier protected uh, reduction in, in loss. And that $90 a ton is accurate, at least in California. So yeah, we've had, I just had a meeting, I had a, a harvest meeting yesterday with the dairy nutritionist and uh, his, uh, uh, um, and his, his, his uh, silage team. And they were talking about in this year, there's been uh, between Kern County and, and up right up to Hillmar, uh, we've had corn uh, that has been in just in the field at uh, uh, pushing $130 a ton now. So 90 is conservative. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next slide, please. So we talk about knowing your barrier and your cover. And we, when we talk to people um, at trade shows and uh, on farm visits, we talk about this all the time. Um, barriers differ. They are not all the same. Um, it depends on a manufacturer um, and it depends on the amount of uh, barrier material within that, within that film. Um, there are films that are um, seven layers, some are nine, some are 11. And um, the amount of barrier in that middle layer determines the effectiveness. So um, I used to do this for trade shows all the time. I would make these bags with bananas in them because I thought, you know, um, what's the fruit that's going to, or what's the material that I can easily get a hold of that will get brown most obvious? and bananas was on my kitchen counter. So I took my food saver and made um, different bags. Now I'm a little more sophisticated. I have a um, actual heat sealer. But so I had done this and Doug DeGroff, who is a, a nutritionist for Diversified Dairy Services in Tulare said, Connie, you know, I appreciate all these banana bag um, things that you do. However, I have customers that say that you're just putting lemon juice on your bananas, which, you know, yeah, everybody knows that makes a fruit salad that you put lemon juice in your bananas and they don't get brown. So I said, okay, Doug, great. I will come to your office and I will make them in front of you and I'll leave them with you and you take the pictures afterwards. So he, that's what we did. So on the left, you can see day one, and then right. on the, sorry, on the right, your other left, um, on the right, you can see day one. And, and then he went, uh, he took several different sequences of pictures, but this was the last one. He couldn't stand having them in his office anymore. So he took uh, day 19. So uh, I don't do this to bash anybody or anything like that, but it's, it is important to educate people that not all silage uh, films, oxygen barriers are the same. It's just how it is. So um, you can see down here on the left-hand side of that left picture, there's a gray film and a purple film. And I'll let you figure out which ones those are. Um, but you'll notice that they're puffed up. Well, they're puffed up because that barrier, that film is not allowing anything to come out of it or into it. And the bananas are pretty clear. Um, and then you can see too, well, you might say, oh, well, there's that blue one up there. And the, those were taken from a, uh, a different places in the, in the role of that film. And, and that manufacturer, uh, sometimes has trouble making sure that the barrier material is completely and evenly put throughout the, the role or the, throughout the film in their manufacturing process. And, and then you can see that others that can, that call themselves barrier, oxygen barriers just absolutely aren't. Um, 
there's there's little to absolutely nothing that's in there. So just we want farmers to be able to to make sure that they're you're, they're not spending money and then wasting it. So uh, so any good uh, film provider will be able to tell you what all the different strength um, machine tests there are. Um, they should be thin um, so that we have that cling factor that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, you could, they measure them in microns or in mils. That's how film has measured. And then you can also do a test for oxygen transfer rate. And you should be able to, the person selling you that film should be able to tell you what the oxygen transmission rate of that film is. Okay, then we move on to covers, black and white covers. So we call the barrier ceiling and the covers are covers. They're black, white film. Um, anywhere from three, four, five, six mil um, thick. And um, they, there again, you should be able to receive tests about what the strength is of those films. And we see, you know, all across the country, there's different places that need different strengths. Um, obviously in say in Nebraska, um, the Kansas, that area, they need something that's going to handle um, the, the wind that's there. In Wisconsin and in the, up in the Northeast, you're going to need um, material that's going to be able to handle the cold. So just be aware. Um, and then there's, a, so sorry, were you going to say something? Well, I was just going to well, just say the um, uh, part, it, it's about being an informed buyer right. of, of, of your product because uh, thickness is not an indication of strength necessarily, because there's a lot of there's a lot of, uh, of, of manufacturers that are using recycled material, which sounds great, but unless they've got a real sophisticated uh, extrusion process to make for a uniform strength throughout, you'll you'll you know they'll find that there'll be some uh, difficulties with being able to ha have that hold together for six months, 12 months or, or more of your storage uh, uh, for your silage. Okay, so next slide, please. Next slide, there we go. Okay, so go ahead and run. Oh, well, once, okay, one, um, uh, one of the things that has been, uh, we, we, we strongly suggest that consideration be made uh, to look at the effectiveness of the outcome, not the convenience uh, that may appear to be, you know, a shortcut in the in the beginning of the process. And one of the things that could be a shortcut would be uh, products that have a they're an all-in-one barrier and cover together. And uh, the the problem is, and it's illustrated here by the red under the under the cover, is that wherever you've got tire tracks the, with a thicker uh, all-in-one cover, you've got oxygen between the silage and the plastic uh, that's over the top. Even if you do have, if it does incorporate an oxygen barrier uh, properties, you're still going to have a, an, an oxygen reservoir there. Uh, that can create a delay in the fermentation and cause other problems. Um, by having the two separate pieces, uh, the barrier film uh, that will and, and then that will cling to the surface, uh, that will get you know, that will give you um, a, a much better outcome in the long run for that. Right. Um, yeah, and the picture on the left is actually taken at the Iowa State Dairy. Um, we have donated film for them to, to use for the past several years, and, uh, and it shows how that film clings to the surface. Um, another point to talk about vapor barrier. Vapor barrier is actually construction film for use under concrete and is not really made for silage. Um, the other thing, don't skimp on overlaps. Uh, have at least three feet on the hem of each side of that uh, drive over pile and uh, use five to six foot overlaps on the barrier and, and then make sure your cover isn't overlapping at the same place. Um, and then last week, Dr. Mahana talked about tires and gravel bags on the perimeter and over the, over the top of the silo for the face, uh, uh, at the face um, so that that doesn't uh, uh, have a problem with air coming in. And you had a comment about that this morning. Oh yeah, I think that, yeah, his 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 uh, recommendation of two rows of gravel bags is uh, is is a is a very good one, uh, and and then making sure that you've got a good perimeter seal, whether it's um, 
uh, you know, gravel bags or uh, an, an extraordinary number of tires, or in some cases, some people will even put uh, sand or some kind of material around the, the outside to keep a good seal to keep air from coming in from underneath there. Right. Next, please. Okay, safety areas of awareness. You can go ahead and put those all up, Gail. Um, we just wanted to briefly touch on this. This is Dr. Keith and Ruthie Bolson's um, information. Um, we wanna talk about in, in the field, being aware of where people are so that nobody gets run over. Uh, obviously, power takeoff shafts are a problem. Um, we want to be careful in making those bunkers, especially with the truck and the tractor rollovers and, and those really incredibly high um, uh, piles. So it's all the more reason to use a drive over pile. Fall from height, that talks about uh, when we have finished with the pile and that we are, uh, if we do a good job, we won't have to pitch any feed and fall from height, fall from a from a top of a silage pile is a, is a problem. Avalanche or collapsing silage, there we go with the density. That density is going to help us avoid those kinds of things. And also good face management will help us with that as well. Silage gases, um, we've, we run into that every once in a while. Um, you maybe have that more so in the Midwest than we do in California, but um, that orange uh, nitrous oxide, that is very, very dangerous and keep away from it. Uh, just it'll dissipate eventually, but stay away from it. Um, some other things that are we don't always think about when we talk about si safety and silage, fatigue. So during harvest, it's a marathon. It's a huge marathon, uh, in fact, I always tell people it's silage season 365 days of the year here at Connor Hydro Science. But um, at the fatigue and, and trying to um, stay uh, healthy, eat well, sleep well during harvest, um, get your rest as much as you can. I know that there's long days of 24 seven harvesting and I, I understand that, but do the best you can to, to get yourself a little bit of rest. Complacency, kind of, you know, going, oh, well, you know, uh, I've done this a million times. I'm I'm 45 years old, and I I have made silage forever. Um, it's um, you can't get complacent about about the si safety issues when making silage. Uh, and finally, alcohol and drug abuse. Uh, have a no no go um, um, set of rules at your place. That there is no alcohol being consumed during silage harvest, and obviously no drug abuse. Next, please. Uh, we, these are the, here's the nitrous oxide we were talking about, the power takeoff shafts, um, this ridiculously high California pile that we, this gentleman is driving on. Um, be, th these all can be avoided. Next, please. And I just wanted to, I know this had not, has not have anything to do with storage, but um, one thing that I saw that is the biggest uh, and, and best thing that I have seen for silage safety is to keep reminders fresh and not only the safety clothing and all that kind of thing, but here at this farm in Minnesota, this uh, farm, they measure how high that silage pile is. And then they go three times the distance, which is the recommended uh, distance away from a pile that you should stay away. And they make a line of safety cones. And every day the feeder who is in charge of taking feed off that silage pile is in charge of also moving those uh, safety cones to the appropriate width distance away from the pile. It, it helps him having to do that reminds him every day of how important it is for him to be careful and do what he's been taught or she has been taught um, as, when it comes to feeding. It also reminds everyone who's driving by those piles that th that's, that sign moves all the time. We can put signs up on posts and that kind of thing. But how many days does it take uh, before we don't see them anymore? But these safety cones were a brilliant idea and it reminds everyone to stay away. Next sign, please. Oh, there we are. Uh, there's our guys at Alberto Dairy with their fancy Seal Pro silage safety vests on. So that's all we had and I'm sorry we took so long, but here we are. Well, thank you. Uh, really great information from all speakers. I appreciate all of that. Lots of lots of good points to start for discussion. Um, so we'll go ahead and start kicking it off with some Q&A here. And again, you're welcome to either unmute yourself and speak up or drop 
uh, drop any questions you have in the chat. Um, I'd like to go ahead and kick off with a question. It's maybe a little bit, uh, uh, you know, big picture before we get started. Uh, you know, when you're working with with producers with farms specifically regarding uh, storage of forages and silages in particular, what are some red flags and green flags that you tend to see? What are some things that you know your top your top couple like ah this is like this is a sign that that something's not quite right here, and what is your what is your sign that like oh these people have it under control they're doing a good job this is really well managed. Yeah, uh, I think it depends on what we are trying to to the term, but you know, uh, I, I think it's very obvious when you arrive in a dairy about how the silage quality is, right? We don't necessarily need to have a full laboratory analysis to say, hey, this is amazing, or, you know, probably there is something here that you have to consider, right? In terms of uh, fermentation quality, obviously, smell, color, uh, if you have any uh, seepage in the floor, uh, how how dry it is the material, if the cows are truly consuming that or not, how the leftovers are and things like that, give you a very good perspective on how the management uh, was, not the specific details, but give you at least an initial picture that you can work with and determine, okay, so what's next, right? Something that I tell our guys to do, to do is that when you're driving on, before you even look at the silage pile, look at the cows because the cows will tell you how they're doing. And the, you know, if they're thin, if they're overfed, um, how much feed is left in that bunk. So that's what I always tell people, look at the cows first, they'll tell you ex exactly what's going on. Yeah, yeah we yeah, we have uh, some uh, independent reps that um, uh, work with our dairy producers uh, in, in the field. And uh, yeah, that's very, that's very important. Uh, to a consideration for, for them to start there. Uh, and then the next thing we, um, um, we, we, you know, we look for is um, um, a, a, feed, a feed inventory on that because uh, we see there's things are out of balance for the time of year. Um, that, that's an indication to me that there was maybe a, a, a um, disconnect in the planning from the previous se seasons on there. And uh, now we've got in, in, in our areas, we can feed, we can add almond holes, we can bring a lot of byproducts in and make some substitutions. Uh, I can, in, in your back, you know, in your backyard there in the Midwest and East, uh, there, you know, if you run out of corn silage, you don't, you're, you don't have a lot of options on there. So that makes it even more important uh, for, you know, for, as you get further east, I think, to be able to make sure that they're, that they're monitoring the plan and following it through. Go ahead, Dr. Hudgens, we'll let you go. And then we have another question that popped up in the chat. Yeah, let, let, let me do a couple quick questions. Uh, uh, Connie, they'll go quick here. First of all, maybe it's just my ignorance, but when you say hem versus overlap, what is the hem and what is the overlap in that bunker or that pile? You want to take the honey? No, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, the, the overlap is going to be where the two, uh, the, you know, the, we recommend a six foot overlap uh, from one film to the other. And then the hem would be uh, the three, three foot of plastic out beyond the silage that you would allow you to put weight on there. And uh, that, was, that was, it was a very good, good point to catch that we, that we didn't clarify that in the beginning. Thank you, Dr. Hutchins. Uh, my second quick question, so I don't take too much time. And, and that is uh, when you do the boot or the tractor tires, what is your goal? Do you wanna see tractor tires or not see tractor tires on the surface of the, of the pile? Or if I'm standing there as a boot, uh, do I wanna sink in or how much do I sink in? Any guidelines on that? Well, you don't want to sink in at all, and and um, and and that's just you know that would be a, you know that would be the ideal situation. Uh, but I think in terms of seeing tire tracks, um, it, if a, the the piles that I've that I have seen, as I walked away from and said, hey, from top to bottom, they paid attention to the details, they made a plan, they followed through on it, and and that's where they're uh, they're 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 going doing what Connie had talked about going forward reverse, repeat. And as they're, they're just moving ever so much, you know, maybe a tire track, you know, only a half a tire track at a time over. And so you're eliminating the tire tracks because you're not 
you know, you're, you're going at a very slow control pace to pack, not just to be uh, taking a sightseeing tour on the top of the silage pile. Then I'm going to go to Luis uh, to, to get you in trouble here. Uh, an interesting question. Uh, if I've got seven, eight percent organic acids, that means that starch and sugar, I can't use my rumen microbes. So it, it, can I have too much acid in my silage? But then I'm cheating my rumen microbes so they cannot produce uh, amino acids, for example. Your thoughts on that? I think everything depends on uh, what is the profile of those acids as well, right? Uh, I think with corn silage, you're not going to reach levels of organic acids that are, uh, let's say, dangerous for bugs, for example, right? And uh, this is similar to a lot of the discussion that we have about, well, if you have a lot of acidic acid, what happens to intake, right? I think it depends what is producing those acids and what is the relationship between those different acids in terms of how that would create a problem, right? I think the most important is uh, if you have very good fermentation in silage is properly preserved, uh, you are making sure that the cows will consume that, right? I don't think you have drops in intake. And I think that the rumen metabolism will still be uh, properly done because you're gonna dilute a lot of that silage with other feeds, including concentrates that will help with that uh, part of the process. My last question for Louise, and that is, uh, maybe you've seen Rick Grant when he uses the four millimeter screen on the Penn State box, and he's calling that effective fiber. Well, what, what's your feeling on the, uh, that feed from the, on the four millimeter box? You know, I understand the eight and the, eight and the 19, but the four millimeter box, he used that in his calculations to, for his physically effective fiber calculation. What's your thoughts on that? It, it, I just wonder, four millimeters is not very long. No, four millimeters is not very long. Uh, I think that the important thing to remember is you don't want particles that are too long that cows can select, right? And you don't want particles that are too short that will pass too fast and not provide enough effective fiber. The way I see the four millimeter sieve is it provides a little bit of effective fiber, but it's not the eight millimeter fiber. Right, I think you need to have enough eight to 19 millimeter fiber particles. Just to give you a perspective on that, I collaborated in a project in Brazil this past year where we actually separated those particles from corn silage and we fed a basal corn silage diet plus above the 19, between the eight and 19 and below the eight millimeter sieve. And what we saw is the eight millimeter particles add to the diet, create more effective fiber than any other treatment, including those particles below. So we have to be careful with anything before below eight, because in my opinion, the true effective fiber is H19 with a little bit of help from the other sieves. Thank you. Okay, let's kind of give a perspective question, and this will be for everybody. Uh, what storage practice has the highest return on investment uh, for producers to get right? I, I think pack, you know, I think uh, packing probably uh, pack, packing density, which which is related to a lot of other things, uh, uh, dry matter, uh, chop length, etc., um, and and then uh, properly sealing um, uh, to to minimize oxygen on there. And uh, he was asking which storage. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you talking about as far as means? As far as which storage. Uh, uh, whether a, a, a bunker or a drive over pile, is that what you're referring no, to? No, no, practice. And practice. you could take it from starting the pile, getting the right size, all the way to, you know, how we pack it or how we face it when we're feeding off the pile. Oh, well, I'll back up and I'll just say make a good plan based on the right, right, the right information from your nutritionist and, and make sure that everyone understands what the objective is and are committed to get there. You know, we have That's been a common about. theme the past few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> something too we, that, that um, I'm sorry, Louise, if you mentioned this, but we haven't talked about kernel processing. And that's something that's really, really important too. Um, it's a detail, but being able to use that starch and that corn silage is pretty important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree completely. Processing to me uh, for corn silage is the most important part of the process. You know, there are so many things that affect that. Uh, but, you know, um, 
I think the most important thing that we have to remember is the word consistency. Cows like consistency, you know, they are grumpy like me, you know, they want to get to their feed and eat exactly what they are used to. They don't want surprises there. So, you know, you need to make sure your entire harvesting season is properly done because if there are parts of the season where, you know, you don't have the correct particle size, proper kernel processing, weird type of fermentation, all of this will create problems because cows will notice and they will notice that fast. So I think if I could choose something and say, hey, pay attention to your consistency and preferably to the good consistency, right? We don't want bad consistency because <laughs> they would not like either, so. We have a question in the chat here. Uh, and I think Luis, you'll be, well, any, anybody can answer this, but um, this kind of ties in with what Luis was talking about with inoculants. Uh, any comments on how additives that are chemical oxygen scavengers compared to hetero fermented for uh, bacteria? Yeah, I think every technology has its own space and opportunities, right, uh, where they can shine. Uh, I think in crops like high moisture corn and corn silage, I think inoculants, uh, at least from my perspective, are more desired uh, because they will help with certain parts of fermentation, right? Modulate the fermentation towards what we want, right? Chemical additives, usually uh, they have potential to actually inhibit some of the fermentation, right? So because of that, you can have both ways, right? You may not achieve the exactly fermentation that you want, even though you're inhibiting the undesired fermentation. For example, I think that propionic acid is great for uh, when you are in siling wet brewer's grain, for example, because you want to keep your wet brewer's grain for a little bit longer, right? But I don't think propionic acid is great for corn silage. I would prefer a good inoculant that will boost my fermentation early on or will help with the acidic acid and aerobic stability later on. So I think you have to evaluate for each scenario, what do you think is best? What are the issues associated with that and which technology fits best with your goals? Okay, I'm gonna go move back to some terminology uh, for Connie and Ron. Uh, Explain what asphalt top concrete should look like. Uh, well, I'll just give you, uh, this was something I, uh, there was a contractor that started doing, I saw that this was up in the Hillmar area, uh, shortly after Hillmar cheese got going, uh, a lot of the dairies there started making some investments in their infrastructure. And one of the things they started doing was replacing their, con their, their concrete wall silage uh, bunkers and then started putting down pad, uh, dry pads for putting drive over piles, uh, which gave them more flexibility. And there was a, and I remember going there and ask, seeing this just absolutely slick surface. And I was just absolutely amazed. And I said, well, how old is this? And they said, well, it's 15 years old. And I couldn't believe it because, and what it was, it, and I actually ended up having met the contractor who did it. And he, he used concrete as a base. So it was very, it was well-packed. Everything was, and then well-packed base concrete, he built it like a road effectively. And then the capping with the, uh, the asphalt protected the concrete from the silage acids. And so after 15 years, and this was 15 years ago, uh, I think I saw, I was out there this last year and there's, that's still, um, you could drive uh, remote control race cars down there with, you know, without getting them, you know, flipped in, uh, into, uh, concrete pits. Luis, you talked about, um, dry matter uh, of when making harvesting decisions. You talked a lot about the importance of maturity and also the importance of proper dry matter. Um, and uh, maybe we've got a little bit of, uh, of um, uh, conflict going on or a little bit of drama here because we had um, Dr. Mahana on uh, a couple weeks ago now. And he said that as long as the corn plant is healthy, we can ignore dry matter altogether. Um, so he's not here to defend himself, but I wonder if you'd like to weigh in on that. And I see that uh, the Coobers are kind of uh, smirking themselves a little bit too, if they want to, if they want to chime in on that as well. Of course, I I'll, will I'll start defending Bill so he doesn't complain with me later. And then after that, I attack him a little bit, if that's okay. <laughs> you know, um, by me. <laughs> so I, I, I think what Bill was trying to say was, if you have a uh, uh, healthy plants and good management, waiting a little bit to harvest is not as bad as it would be as if you have issues with uh, management, uh, you know that very likely you're going to have a delay because of, I don't know, maybe the custom harvester, rain, anything that you cannot control, 
right? So, but from my perspective, I see maturity uh, this way. The more the plant matures, less digestible is fiber, less digestible is starch, regardless of kernel processing. Chemically, that's how it works. It's plant physiology, you know, and I don't think Bill will disagree with that, right? Uh, obviously, uh, there are scenarios that change a little bit, right? There are certain dry matter and kernel dry matter maturities where you can still process silage well, and there are others that you cannot, right? Even if you have very good processing, very good monitoring during harvest, etc. I think part of the issue that I see is when we target for late maturity corn silage, any issue that we have will put the vast majority of our silage in the very upper end where it's harder to break kernels. Okay, uh, some people consider that, well, we can shatter better kernels. That's not true at all. Okay, uh, I, I highly disagree with that. You may be lucky and be able to do that, but the vast majority of dairies will not. You will end up with a lot of intact kernels, right? So that's why I think we have to be careful even when we have healthy plants. Of course, that if you have a great field, this gives you more flexibility on how to harvest and when to harvest. So from that perspective, I do not disagree with him. Yeah, I thought, that was, I, thought I, I was, when, when, he, when he first threw that out, I, I, I was a little bit taken aback and then I got to thinking about it some more and um, and, and it, it, it does put a bit different perspective on it, but, but I think a big part of it was, uh, I think he, what he was, what I understood him to say is that with the high value of the starch uh, from the corn, uh, from the kernels, uh, getting an extra point by going to three quarter uh, or even black layer, uh, that economic benefit, you know, offsets, you know, as long as the plant is healthy. And I think that's the big, you know, that's uh, that's the big caveat. There is as long as the, the plant is healthy, um, your you, your your risk of of letting it go a few extra days is is low. He did emphasize that point, um, the the importance of a plant that's not stressed, a, a healthy a healthy plant. So, excellent responses. <laughs> Let's uh, consider this year's crop for. The next question, uh, what are you seeing out there? I know uh, we're from across the country, but what is striking you? Uh, and let's go ahead and start with Louise. I haven't traveled much this this silent season, but the few fields that I saw, they, they, they look in good shape. You know, uh, I'm actually happy with the, the current crop. Uh, I do think we'll have uh, good silage, especially good corn silage. Right, I don't think we had any weather, uh, main weather issues as we had the previous, let's say three to four, maybe five years, right? Which is kind of cyclic. So I expect the silage to be a little bit better than we saw uh, the last maybe two, three years. Although I do think the last year we had a very good crop, except that uh, some dairies saw lower starch digestibility than usual for whatever reason that we don't know how to explain. Uh, in, in the last three weeks, um, let's see, I think I've been, well, I've been in, into, uh, I've seen corn in uh, Missouri, uh, Arizona, uh, California, and Washington State, and uh, uh, everyone's got different challenges. I mean, in, in Missouri, uh, the southeast or southwestern uh, Missouri, uh, they were just in an absolute uh, almost panic because of the, uh, the, dr the drop conditions that were there. Uh, they fortunately got a little bit of rain here a, couple, a week and a half ago, uh, but before that, <clears throat> they were they were really uh, uh, it, was, it was just burning up, and there was very very little whole plant moisture. So those those are the cases were some depending on where you were, um, the um, there were some plants that were not healthy. Um, Arizona, uh, they um, if they had water, they had a good crop, uh, and they were taking really good care of it. Uh, again, because the limitation of water, same situation in California. Uh, I was just, just up around the um, uh, Moses Lake uh, Sunnyside area where there's some feed lots and dairies up there. Uh, they're, overall, they're, they're, uh, they're, their crop looked good and healthy, and uh, they were just getting, uh, just getting ready to start, uh, start into some of those fields up there. One thing I just, I, I mentioned uh, that yesterday, I did have a, a pre-harvest meeting uh, uh, in uh, Tulare, um, and one of the things that came up was about the new um, recommendations on, on, on evaluation of um, a processing score, where uh, 
you know, instead of 70 being the target, 75 is now the target, or that's what's being proposed. And one of the things that came up in that discussion was instead of having, I think there were three, uh, uh, three levels, um, uh, minimal uh, or adequate, uh, or optimum adequate and not acceptable. Um, you know, maybe there should we include one in there between that 50 and 60, maybe that was be listed as marginal. And, uh, and, just, and again, but it, it, the, the, those numbers have been improving, which is, you know, is indicative of the, uh, the way the industry has uh, paid attention to that, uh, whether it's the dairyman, nutritionist, or the, or the custom harvesters uh, that are focusing on that. And, and the results are, you know, the education is getting out there, so. Yeah, I think that's a great idea to include another category there. And uh, uh, just one comment, uh, you know, uh, I think kernel processing score is a great tool, right? Uh, and definitely help us to move forward with processing. But there is something that we have to consider is that like every other laboratory assay, there are flaws with that, right? So for example, if you harvest immature silage where the kernels are too soft, sometimes they don't break, right? Sometimes they will be smashed and even though they are completely open and the starch available for digestion, when you run those through kernel processing score assays, it's gonna look like the, the processing was awful, right? And sometimes this is not true. So I think we need to combine numbers with the visual uh, because the kernel processing score does not tell the whole story, right? The other thing that is important to remember is when the assay was developed, this was to indicate kernels broken in theoretically four pieces, right? Well, maybe you're going to have silos that is, I don't know, let's just throw a random number here, 85% less than four pieces with uh, broken into more than four pieces, right? But maybe you have a silage that is actually broken into 70%, uh, but the kernel is so shattered that it's actually more digestible. So we have to combine the visual with the number uh, because there is more to that than the uh, kernel processing score. Nothing against the assay, I think is great and recommend that. I just think we have to combine different technologies, including, uh, I think Bill mentioned during his discussion, uh, the silage cup that they have, any assay similar to that, right? We suggest that too, some sort of flotation where you separate kernels and you actually see that to make sure those are broken or if they are not broken, at least they are smashed. So you have a good perspective on that because the kernel processing score will come back after you send the sample to the lab, silage season will be over so you have to watch that before so yeah that's a great reminder so any uh you know kind of to wrap this discussion up any any final words of wisdom uh when it comes to you know looking at not just this year's corn silage harvest that's, that's coming up within the next is already happening for some people are coming up very shortly for others um you know not even just this year's uh, harvest, but looking ahead to learning from what we did this year and, and looking into planning for next year. Any any last thoughts um, from Luis or the Coopers? No, the only thing I would reiterate is, you know, remember consistency. You know, uh, year after year or within a season is very important, right? I always joke about consistency saying that, you know, uh, there are small herds in Brazil that the cows are used to milk very well when there is uh, Brazilian country music playing okay. during the milking time. And if you turn off the radio a day, everything is a mess, right? It's not because they love Brazilian country music. It's simply because they are adapted to that. And everything that changes their routine goes very bad. So remember the word consistency, because regardless of what you do uh, with dairy cows, nutrition and management, I do think is a good way that uh, you can ensure uh, good practice as well as a good outcome. So. Um, I guess the only uh, my my closing thought would be to uh, uh, going back to to making a plan, evaluate where you know what uh, the situation that you've had, and 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 look at you know what are what are the steps that we can take to improve the situation. Um, you know you can plan for for a perfect outcome, but uh, be grateful for making progress towards that outcome and consider, you know, you know, make taking baby steps. Cause, uh, if you could do everything perfect the first year, 
And Nick, maybe you found the magic solution there. <laughs> Congratulations and kudos. But uh, uh, if you if, if you if you at least make some progress on find, getting some more cost effective feed, then then this discussion has been uh, helpful. So yeah, good luck. I would I would add that. Um, being the consistency is absolutely right on and making a plan. And like Ron said, if you, you try to try to improve on a few things each year and harvest is such an out of ordinary um, activity. It's something that we don't do every day. We don't, it's not like milking cows or feeding cows or feeding calves or that kind of thing. It's something that's Di that's different. And um, it's a marathon. It's a, it's a long, long process. And don't give up. The ones, the people who, who get a medal at a marathon are the people that cross the finish line. So cross the finish line, do all the steps that you plan to do, and, and do the best with what you can. That's something that Ron and I, we've worked for a long time together <laughs> and it's uh, you know it's doing the best you can with what you have so good luck have fun enjoy the process <laughs>